All right. Good evening, everyone. We're going to give uh, maybe a minute or two more for our, all of our colleagues to be able to get joined for this uh, session tonight. So just uh, hold on tight. Uh, it'll be in two minutes we get started. Maybe one more minute and we'll get started. All right, so we're going to get started now. Uh, welcome to the Grand Rounds. Uh, uh, we will just uh, display our initial rituals to show the places where the Grand Rounds uh, lectures are stored. Uh, you will find the lectures again here uh, on the YouTube uh, channel dedicated to the division. Uh, and for getting the CME credits for the session, please text 20396 to the number 888-816. 4893 as a SMS message, and you'll be able to get your CME credit uh, if you have an active profile in the Rutgers Cloud CME platform. And for the MOC, uh, please complete the step one and then the link, which is again going to be displayed in the chat. Uh, you can use that with the room code futures64. And as long as you are able to answer the questions correctly, uh, you are able to get your credits for MOC. Uh, in the ABIM ID, which is there in the cloud CME profile. So once more, the CME credit to the number, text the number 20396 to the phone number 888-816-4893. And then followed by that, you can get your MOC credit if you use the link and the future 64 code, room code. With that, I'm very pleased today to bring on uh, our guest presenter for today's uh, session, Dr. Umberto Campia. Dr. Campia, welcome. Um, I just came to know Dr. Campia uh, recently uh, through our colleague, Dr. Kamu Maganti, who introduced uh, him to me and realized what a fascinating uh, work that he's been doing and was very exciting for me to invite him for a grand rounds. Dr. Umberto Campia is the Associate Physician in the Cardiology and Vascular Medicine at Brigham and Women Hospital in Boston. And he's also, as also the Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston. He's one of the very rare uh, members, faculty members and uh, cardiologists who have had uh, extensive training, not only just in cardiology, but also in vascular medicine. He's, he's board certified in internal medicine, adult cardiology and vascular medicine. And uh, I asked him how he branched into his uh, uh, field, and he mentioned that uh, he initially started uh, with his interest in internal medicine and endocrinology and metabolics, which led him to his uh, interest in vascular physiology. He was a visiting associate at NHLBI uh, as a, in the field of vascular physiology a uh, long time back in 98 to 2001, and subsequently was also a research associate and vascular physiology in MedStar Research Institute in Washington. Subsequently, he did his residency in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease fellowship, and then had two years of both clinical and research training as an advanced cardi cardiology vascular fellow uh, in vascular medicine at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Uh, prior to his appointment in uh, Brigham, uh, Dr. Campia established and directed the section of vascular medicine at MedStar Washington 
hospital center and was also in the faculty there. Since then, he has been uh, committed to a large extent, not only in diversifying in different aspects of general cardiology, but also he runs a very busy program in vascular medicine. He has got a special interest in aortic disease, uh, and also he oversees uh, work in cardiovascular oncology, and he's committed to a specific role in vascular oncology. Uh, so it's really very well specialized. Uh, and as a part of this multidisciplinary program, which includes the aortic disease program, he works in collaboration with cardiologists and vascular surgeons and takes care of an extensive uh, uh, uncommon presentations uh, that you see. So he's really one of the rare specialists who focuses on early detection and management of advanced diseases like aortic diseases, but also he has extensive interest in unique fields like vascular oncology clinics and cardio cardiac oncology, which focuses on uh, specific manifestation form of vascular complication of cancer and cancer-related diseases. He also does uh, uh, extensively uh, staffing in electronic console services uh, with a broad spectrum of uh, questions that are related to electronic medical records. His CV boasts of uh, extensive uh, publication list of over 50 publications, and he has been in multiple clinical trial, and he has an extensive uh, work and in research as well. He's uh, well known for his uh, uh, interest in teaching, and he has also had clinical supervisory and training responsibilities. With that, today he's going to come and uh, uh, tell us on his uh, journey and specific aspects of vascular medicine. And to bring on the panel also, we have, uh, and I'd like to bring on the panel right now, if it's possible, uh, Dr. Sam Rahimi uh, joins us. Uh, Dr. Rahimi is the Division Chief of Vascular Surgery. And we have really enjoyed um, working with Dr. Rahimi uh, in his capacity as the Division Chief, and he has really supported the program, uh, along with Dr. Ashish Avasti, who is the director in the cath lab and oversees the vascular interventional program. So to both uh, Dr. Rahimi and Dr. Avasti, thanks for sparing our time. And once Dr. Campia completes his presentation, it'll be great for us to have you also on the panel to have a quick discussion on. Now, uh, I invite Dr. Campia, you to give your presentation and we look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank and I'm going to share my screen. And and I think you can, can you see my screen? We can see your slides and uh, if you could put them on slideshow, let's see if okay. um, it should be at the bottom. Yeah. Perfect. So you have, to, yeah, perfect. Excellent. So thank you so much for your invitation. I have a long list of slides, so I'll try to be as efficient as possible. Thank, again, it's a, an honor, a privilege to be here. I hope to convey uh, the passion that I have for uh, vascular medicine is a, a very unique field that covers uh, a number of conditions that otherwise would probably be left uh, unrecognized and, and untreated. I have no conflicts of interest to, to disclose, and uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about any unapproved uh, indications. Uh, our learning objectives today are to identify the major pathological conditions and clinical syndrome encompassed by vascular medicine. Because of time constraint, I will have to really reduce to a very sort of a small handful. Uh, we want to familiarize with the principles and the indications of first-line diagnostic vascular testing. We want to familiarize with the role of the vascular medicine specialist in the management of patients with vascular disease. We also want to recognize the pivotal role of a multidisciplinary approach to the patient with vascular disease. And this is really, we are not uh, um, able to manage these complex patients on our own. We really need the expertise of multiple perspectives and uh, the ability to uh, come to a consensus on what to um, uh, do for a patient. Vascular medicine uh, is a relatively uh, sort of new discipline. Uh, 
is in this medical subspecialty that focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of diseases that uh, involving in the uh, circulatory system. On December 1st, 1997, the American Medical Association recognized vascular medicine as a primary specialty of area of practice. Unfortunately, the a fellowship is not yet recognized by the American Board of Internal Medicine, but there is a, the a Society for Vascular Medicine and the uh, Vascular Medicine Boards are available for whoever is interested. Today, uh, um, uh, I was going to try to cover as much as possible, but again, time constraints um, uh, are um, limiting. But we can uh, still uh, have to remember that uh, our vascular medicine, the circulation, includes arterial uh, circulation, the venous circulation, and the lymphatic circulation. Because of um, uh, time limitations, I'm not going to cover lymphatics, and I'm going to cover only main uh, topics in arterial and venous disease. Uh, starting with arterial, I'm going to uh, talk briefly about extracranial carotid artery disease. And uh, most commonly, uh, extracranial carotid artery disease, which usually is uh, refers more to the internal carotid artery. But we have to remember that the uh, cerebrovascular circulation, the extra Cranial cerebrovascular circulation includes the common carotid, internal carotid, external carotid, the many branches of the external carotid, and then the posterior circulation, the um, vertebral arteries that join to form the um, uh, basal artery. And the, these arteries are not only connected with the brain, where obviously have an extremely important role, but also are connected with the aorta and uh, or its major branches. So these arteries are really at the um, intersection of the uh, aortic disease and ce cerebrovascular disease. So uh, we will see that there uh, these arteries, uh, the imaging and the evaluation may go beyond just the scope of the, um, the sort of neck extracranial uh, component. Uh, the um, most common manifestation of atherosclerotic um, is, um, uh, disease, both of, I would say, the anterior circulation, so mostly the internal carotid artery, common carotid, internal carotid, and posterior circulation, the vertebral artery, uh, are these acute manifestations are cerebrovascular events, either transient ischemic attacks or strokes. In the mechanism, in most cases, is a plaque rupture or ulceration, usually at the level of the bifurcation of the um, uh, carotid into internal and external carotid. It, that leads to the formation of um, superficial thrombi, luminal thrombi, that eventually detach and um, cause arterial to arterial embolization. This is different from what we normally expect as cardiologists, the thrombosis of a, a coronary artery at the level of the rupture plaque. So um, similar pathophysiology of the rupture of the plaque, but different mechanism, Embol artery to artery embolization rather than acute occlusion and thrombotic occlusion. And uh, we have to keep in mind that the degree of stenosis of the internal carotid artery is a predictor of the risk of uh, is complication of cerebrovascular events. And we def define cerebrovascular disease, carotid disease, as asymptomatic, no cerebrovascular events in the patient's history, or symptomatic, the occurrence of a focal neurologic symptoms. <clears throat> We have to keep in mind, however, that arteries are not only uh, prone to develop atherosclerosis. We can have a large number of other mechanisms that can cause uh, the development of arterial pathology. And among them, these are just a, a few, Not is not a comprehensive list, but we can uh, consider carotid dissection, either spontaneous or in the setting of a, a trauma, occasionally it can be in the setting of a, a procedure. Um, 
fibromuscular dysplasia. Uh, and Dr. Jeff Olin, who is uh, really the world expert of fibromuscular dysplasia, who is at uh, Mount Sinai in New York, calls it the most common disease that Domba did knows about. It's relatively common, can affect different arteries, renal arteries and carotid arteries are the most common, but it can affect other arteries and can be associated also with other complications such as a dissection or aneurysm formation that uh, are uh, uh, independently uh, associated with additional uh, manifestations. So fibromuscular dysplasia often found incidentally needs to be considered a, a non -free, very frequent non-atherosclerotic carotid disease. Uh, carotid body tumor or other rare tumors. I put this <clears throat> ultrasound here. I, this is an ultrasound that I recently interpreted in the vascular lab. And this is a, a, a schwannoma originating from, a, um, a, from the vagus nerve. So this is a, a really a zebra among the zebras because the uh, carotid body tumors or uh, tumors in that area are already rare, but this is really rare. And aneurysms, uh, aneurysms can be associated with a plaque that causes weakening of the wall. Sometimes they can be associated with fibromuscular dysplasia, sometimes can be idiopathic but also um, are a, a relatively common uh, manifestation uh, of a, a carotid disease. Arteritis, part of the usually giant cell arteritis. Also radiation-induced injury. Uh, several patients that undergo radiation of the neck um, and head because of uh, usually uh, carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma of the oral cavity or lymphomas often uh, develop radiation-induced injury, sometimes with thrombosis as an acute event, sometimes with long-term complications, including calcifications um, <clears throat> and uh, atherosclerosis. The diagnostic modalities for um, uh, carotid artery disease and cerebrovascular disease include uh, carotid uh, ultrasound, I call it more cerebrovascular ultrasound because it's not just carotid. And we can see here that we uh, image different uh, arteries on the top from left to right. We are, uh, there is a visualization of the common carotid artery with a, um, we call it a triplex image. We have the 2D, we have the color Doppler, and we have the a, a pulse wave Doppler. And we see that there is a predictable morphology of the uh, Doppler waveform. This is very important. With one look, uh, let's say, at the uh, waveform in the common carotid artery, one could already detect a occlusion of the internal carotid artery or uh, other forms of disease. So these are very important uh, diagnostic tools. We can see here on the next slide, on sorry, on the next um, uh, uh, image on the right, that uh, the uh, there is a large plaque that is calcified, and is at the beginning of the internal carotid artery. The calcifications are um, associated with this dropout of the uh, signal beyond uh, the um, the plaque. And we can see here when we put the color Doppler that there is turbulent flow. And again, there is a shadowing from the calcified plaque. And when we measure the velocity of the blood flow at the, um, at the level of the proximal internal carotid artery, we see that the systolic velocity is extremely elevated. And also the diastolic velocity is extremely elevated. Based on these, we know that there is a correlation between velocity, uh, systolic and diastolic velocity, and the degree of stenosis that uh, uh, can be detected by invasive angiography. And this would give us a stenosis of 90 to 99%. And 
uh, we can see that uh, the exam, the duplex ultrasound, does not stop at the internal carotid artery. There is also the evaluation of the external carotid artery and the vertebral artery. And we can see also that the Doppler waveforms uh, is relevant for our uh, diagnostic evaluation. Now, because I will show you a, an abnormal um, vertebral artery waveform, I just bring your attention to the bottom right figure where there is a normal a vertebral artery waveform with a sharp increase of the systolic velocity, systolic velocity of about 70, and a drop in diastole. So this is a forward flow or antegrade flow normal waveform. And we will see soon that this is not necessarily uh, present in uh, all studies. Excellent. Other modalities are angiographic modalities. We have a CT angiography, we have MRI angiography. They're pretty similar with regards to resolution. The MRI angiography has the advantage that if needed can be done without contrast which is very important in patients, let's say, that have advanced uh, renal disease, that, that they are at risk of um, uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. And then on the right panel, we can see the, the digital subtraction in geography that was the gold standard in the past. Right now, is used very infrequently only in patients who need to undergo an endovascular revascularization. How do we treat patients with atherosclerotic uh, car um, uh, 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 carotid disease? Well, uh, medical therapy works. And now patients who are on aspirin, on statin, who are uh, quitting smoking when they smoke and who, has, who are on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, and they are obviously asymptomatic, and they have mild, moderate internal carotid artery stenosis, that's all that is needed. They don't need revascularization. There is an uh, ongoing uh, trial that is going to look specifically, compare medical management, it's called the CRAS-2 medical management, internal uh, uh, stenting and surgery to determine if uh, the medical management is non-inferior to the revascularization. But uh, in patients who have symptoms, any uh, symptoms consistent with a, a, a cerebrovascular uh, manifestation, a focal manifestation, uh, revascularization with carotid endarterectomy or carotid stenting is indicated. Or when the, they are asymptomatic and they have high degree stenosis, the 90 to 99% stenosis, for instance, they have an, in, an indication for revascularization. Now, how do we manage these patients? Many times patients are referred to me, I'm a vascular specialist, but I don't do procedure, I don't do surgery. So I need to have a vascular um, a interventionalist or to have a vascular surgeon that can provide the appropriate treatment. So besides vascular medicine, we need to have vascular surgery involved. Many times we need to have neurology. These patients may have had uh, um, uh, symptoms that we are not able to determine are they real uh, uh, cerebrovascular events or not. Uh, neuroradiology, oftentimes we do need to have the expertise for further imaging. Sometimes interventional radiology does the stenting uh, or neurosurgery. So uh, really it can be, depending on the institution, a different combination of providers. And obviously we need imagers. Um, sometimes if the patient has a, a giant cell arteritis that is causing uh, acute occlusion, uh, sometimes they present with a amaurosis fugax, you need rheumatology to start anti-inflammatory therapy. Moving to the next um, uh, topic, the upper extremity arterial disease. This is a very um, uh, sort of, uh, I would say, um, uh, is less recognized than it should be. And I had, and I will present a case in which the lack of recognition uh, was uh, really going to affect this patient's management. So upper extremity arterial disease is less frequent than lower extremity disease. Atherosclerotic disease is prevalent in the older population, but in the younger population, 
There are other causes. There may be mechanical obstruction of the thoracic outlet, which we call the thoracic outlet syndrome. There can be embolism. Uh, patients also with atrial fibrillation or uh, the thoracic outlet, arterial thoracic outlet or plaque. Uh, trauma, obviously. Uh, digital artery vasospasm and digital artery occlusion. Uh, in this picture, we can see here, uh, this is a patient that actually was in my vascular oncology clinic. This is a patient who was in her early 60s, no uh, history of uh, cardiovascular risk factors of atherosclerotic risk factors. She had a newly diagnosed um, um, ovarian cancer. She presented with these necrotic uh, digits. The vascular uh, workup was negative for any obstruction, and the patient uh, underwent uh, chemotherapy for her initial chemotherapy and then surgery. And if soon after she started chemotherapy for the ovarian cancer, this lesion starting to heal. And after chemotherapy and surgery, uh, the lesions completely healed. She has not had any recurrence. So this was a, um, a, a paraneoplastic syndrome. And the patient actually, instead on the above uh, picture, had giant cell arteritis. And this patient uh, pre uh, presented with uh, polymyalgia rheumatica uh, symptoms, and the uh, ultrasound showed that the distal subclavian artery was uh, uh, almost occluded uh, by the edema and the involvement of the uh, wall. Um, oh, uh, so the uh, other causes, as I mentioned, thoracic outlet syndrome, embolism, vasospasm of right nodes, vasculitis, arthrosclerosis, but also trauma and iatrogenic. How do we study? Well, uh, obviously, uh, we do first physiologic studies. This actually is the waveform of the patient that I showed you with the uh, paraneoplastic syndrome. And you can see that her digits uh, were um, uh, on right and left were normally perfused. So this was a microvascular um, uh, type of manifestation. And do we, uh, we can do segmental pressure, you, pressure in the um, uh, brachial artery, pressure in the arterial, radial artery, pressure in the digits. And we can do the photoplethysmography with or without a provocative maneuver, in this case, warming. You don't want to put these patients that already have a vasospastic phenomenon into cold water because you can trigger a, in a highly uh, sort of uh, difficult to treat a vasoconstrictive crisis. And there have been, unfortunately, bad consequences with that. In imaging studies, the arterial ultrasound with or without maneuvers for the thoracic outlet, CT angiography, MRI angiography that can be done with the maneuvers. Recently I had this young gentleman that came in with these weird symptoms and uh, with uh, ultrasound maneuvers didn't seem to have any thoracic outlet. I sent him for an MRI and the MRI did show the presence of a, a compression of the, in this case was the venous compression. And then we do laboratory testing for vasculitis. Obviously this is uh, often directed by the rheumatologist. I want to present a clinical case that is emblematic. So the, in, uh, this is a patient that I've uh, taken care of. It is a 79 year old woman. She had mild obesity. She had a however, heavy smoking history, but she quit uh, several years ago. She has obviously COPD and she has peripheral artery disease with claudication, bilateral femoral artery uh, stenosis, of almost occlusion with claudication. And she was referred by the vascular surgeon because she had chronic hypotension. And I was consulted as a cardiologist to help her manage uh, hypotension perioperatively. And this hypotension was first noted uh, in 2017 at the time when she had hip replacement surgery. Postoperatively, because she was persistently hypotensive, she was admitted to the, to the surgical ICU and she was given IV pressors. Her blood pressure barely responded, was in the low 100 systolic, and they consulted cardiology. In cardiology, thought, hmm, this 
there doesn't seem to be a cardiac source. So they recommended endocrinology evaluation for possible adrenal insufficiency for chronic hypotension. They did a cosyntropin test, a stimulation test, and was normal. So they say, nope, this is not adrenal insufficiency. So what did they do? They discharged her just as a, a cosmetic, in my opinion, uh, approach on midodrine, 10 milligrams, so that her blood pressure was better uh, looking on when she was checking it. Subsequently, however, her some systolic blood pressure was chronically in the 70s to 90s with occasional dizziness, but overall she was doing well, pretty, pretty functional. And eventually her outpatient cardiologist stopped the midodrine because it was not effective. Okay, at least he said, it's not going to change anything, so let's stop it. So I saw her, and so uh, I examined her, I tested her, I checked the pressures in the arms, I checked the pressures at the ankles, I did my sort of due diligence, and I uh, wrote in my um, uh, assessment. So the patient has a history of extensive peripheral arterial occlusive disease, the clinical presentation of chronic hypotension with no symptoms and no response to midodrine or even IV pressors, is not physiological congruent. Therefore, I checked the systolic blood pressure in the lower extremities. Despite the presence of occlusion of the superficial femoral arteries, okay, occluded, her systolic blood pressure in the left dorsalis spedis was 120. This indicated to me that the aortic pressure is most likely higher uh, than that because she had that severe stenosis. So uh, I was not uh, convinced that she was chronically hypotensive. And I thought this patient probably has polyvascular disease. Let me check if she's had any studies. And so, yes, she had had a CT and geography of the chest done too how many years before. It was March 2022, three years before. And this was an angiographic study, not reported any stenosis of uh, the um, uh, brachial arteries. So I just look at the images and I saw this. I thought, hmm, this looks pretty much occluded, occlusion of both um, the a subclavian artery. I went downstairs, I talked with the radiologist. He looked at that, at the images and said, yes, this is bilateral occlusion of the subclavian uh, arteries. Okay, and that's why the patient had the hypotension, not because she had chronic hypotension as a sort of cardiovascular uh, syndrome. And then I also looked at the carotid ultrasound that she had had in 2021. And lo and behold, you remember I mentioned, look at the carotid, uh, at the vertebral artery in the other study that is positive. Well, this patient has bilateral vertebral artery flow reversal, complete reversal. This is consistent with the bilateral uh, occlusion of the vertebr of the subclavian arteries. So this patient went from being a cardiac hy chronic hypotension to be a polyvascular disease patient. Obviously, we don't have a good way to measure her blood pressure, and this is challenging. And um, the I spoke with the inter with the vascular surgeon to see if he could do at least open one of the arteries, it was not able. So still, she uh, has this bilateral uh, subclavian occlusion. But again, this is a case in which multidisciplinary management was essential. Vascular medicine, vascular surgery, vascular radiology, and interventional cardiology in case, uh, you know, she needs some form of revascularization, could be interventional radiology and rheumatology. Okay, so moving forward, thoracic aortic disease, another very broad topic. And uh, I'm gonna focus only on aneurysm and acute aortic syndrome. So an aneurysm in general, in an, in an artery is defined as the dilatation of, uh, of the artery that is 
one and a half or more times the expected normal diameter. And this is always a bit of questionable sort of what is normal, but anyway, there is some consensus. And this threshold can be used to define aneurysm of the descending abdominal aorta. However, a different definition is necessary for the ascending aorta and the aortic root because the risk of dissection increases substantially at diameters that are well below the 1.5 times threshold that would be based on this criteria. And these are the data that have uh, suggested that the um, uh, size of the aorta, uh, uh, of the, uh, the aortic root and ascending aorta has to be lower than 1.5 to define as a dilatation of an aneurysm. And this is because the uh, history of aortic aneurysm is a progressive dilatation over time in the risk of aortic dissection and potentially rupture. And data show that the relative risk of aortic dissection begins to increase appreciably at an ascending diameter of 4 to 4.5 centimeters, and then increases sharply when the diameter is 4.5 centimeters higher. That's why the most recent Oh, sorry, guidelines, and uh, sorry again, the most recent guidelines have a threshold of four centimeters to define as a dilatation and 4.5 centimeters to define as an aneurysm. The real prevalence of thoracic aortic aneurysms are known because they are asymptomatic. However, there are sort of data, the, the, uh, the case series that report uh, a five to 10 per 100,000 person years. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the first presentation of thoracic aortic aneurysm often is a life-threatening acute aortic syndrome, a dissection, tremural hematoma, or impending rupture, or even a rupture. And so that's why aneurysm are challenging to detect and often now they are detected incidentally. What are the risk factors for the occurrence of aortic aneurysm? So obviously hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, the, usually, the usual sort of uh, cardiovascular uh, atherosclerotic risk factors, smoking, and also some heritable genetic variants. Then the guidelines define as not risk factors, but causes of thoracic aneurysm, uh, heritable disorders, congenital conditions, degenerative conditions, previous aortic dissection, inflammatory infectious diseases. And so this is a list that, again, is present in the guidelines, I'm not going over in detail. And, but many aneurysms of the aortic root and the ascending thoracic aorta are sporadic, not familiar, not associated with uh, syndromic uh, uh, features. Or, uh, so they are either sporadic or uh, also defined as idiopathic. And it's important to keep in mind that patients with thoracic aortic aneurysm have a modestly increased incidence of abdominal aortic aneurysm and cerebral aneurysm. So uh, often I screen patients who are first diagnosed with, incidentally diagnosed with thoracic aortic aneurysm. I screen their and neck and brain, and I screen their entire aorta and branches. So sometimes you find um, uh, the presence of other pathology, fibromuscular dysplasia, sometimes other aneurysm, uh, 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 abdominal aneurysm, iliac artery aneurysm, sometimes uh, other vasculopathy, uh, segmental arterial mediolysis. How do we uh, uh, treat uh, aneurysm. Well, first of all, we want to control uh, risk factors, particularly hypertension, and the guidelines uh, are consistent with the treatment of hypertension for patients who have hypertension. They all, the uh, main characteristics is they recommend a beta blocker, and uh, if needed, the addition of an ARB to a beta blocker. Now, if the patients have atherosclerosis, obviously statin is indicated, if they're smoking, they should stop smoking. And if they have atherosclerosis, because they, that could be a sign of increased cardiovascular risk, also aspirin therapy can be considered. Sometimes patients have aortic aneurysm and a syndrome that, such as Marfan syndrome. In these patients, again, beta blocker, 
or an ARB is recommended even if their blood pressure is not elevated and if uh, they uh, are um, tolerating, you want to use the maximum uh, tolerated dose. Uh, all patients with an aneurysm should can undergo a surveillance because aneurysm tend to uh, uh, progressively dilate and surveillance may be as uh, short as uh, interval as six months or as long as two years. So this has to be individualized. In the uh, repair, if the aneurysm is sporadic, the repair is a threshold is considered 5.5 centimeters or higher. If patients have a growth in the aneurysm of five millimeters in one year or three millimeters or more in uh, two consecutive years. Also, if the patient has symptoms at any time, okay? Symptoms are vague. So some patients may have vague chest pain, may have back pain. In that case is a clinical judgment, but is very important. And also in patients who have asymptomatic aneurysm that are not meeting the 5.5 or higher threshold, but they have a 5 centimeter uh, or two, up to 5.4 centimeter aneurysm that are part of a multidisciplinary aortic group, let's say like the one at the Brigham, the guidelines uh, say that mm, it is reasonable to lower the threshold to uh, 5 uh, centimeters or uh, up to 5.4. And then there are other details I'm not going to focus on right now. I'm going to move on to acute aortic syndromes, which are the acute manifestations of aortic disease and are life-threatening conditions in which there is a damage and a breach of the integrity of the aortic wall. We can see here that the, there is the classical dissection in which there is a tear in the intima and the formation of an intima media uh, uh, flap and a, in, a media adventitia outer wall. And this uh, flap causes the entrance of uh, blood in these false lumen the blood may enter, and if there is a, um, another tear, may exit. But if there is no tear, the blood may pull there, and there is a reduction in the size of the uh, lumen that can uh, lead to complications. The other uh, acute aortic syndrome is intramural hematoma, in which there is pooling of blood into the wall that dissects the intima media from the media adventitia layer, but there is no tear. So the blood is coming from the vas azorum, which are the arteries that feed the main artery. So the intramural hematoma behaves like a, dissec like a dissection, but there is no tear in the intima. Then we have the penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer in which there is a uh, formation of a sort of focal dissection. And the focal dissection is due to the deepening of this ulceration of the plaque. And again, this can lead to a, a rupture or a, eventually to the a progression towards a dissection. And here we can see just in cross section the uh, uh, schematic of the uh, aortic dissection. And here, this is a, a pathologic specimen in which the intima tear, uh, tear can be seen here. And we can see the thrombus in the uh, space, the, in the false lumen. And uh, this is relevant because the dissection can propagate in an integrate retrograde fashion from the initial tear, involve aortic branches, and can cause complications as mild perfusion syndrome. I've had patients that the first symptoms that they had was a cerebrovascular manifestation. I've had patients that the first symptom was a sort of mild visual abnormality. Uh, have had patients that presented with pericardial tamponade and syncope, aortic regurgitation, or even myocardial ischemia. In these cases, it's very difficult to discriminate between an ST elevation from a 
a dissection into a coronary artery from a, a dissection. And the patient sometimes goes to the cath lab and the uh, uh, cath lab uh, sort of uh, procedure if eventually uh, finds the presence of the, uh, of the dissection. Uh, the uh, main uh, ways for us to uh, classify dissections, very briefly, the Debeke dissection divides in uh, one, two, and three with uh, three A and three B. The um, Stanford, which is more commonly used, divides only in type A and type B. Type A, there is a tear in the ascending aorta, Type B, there is no tear in the ascending aorta, and the tear is usually in the descending aorta. Occasionally, rarely, there is an involvement of the arch, which is not a type A, is a type B, according to the Stanford uh, classification. Now, uh, how do we diagnose a patient with an acute aortic syndrome? Obviously, clinical suspicion has to be high. And uh, at that point, we need to order the appropriate imaging. And the goals of imaging should confirm the diagnosis, give an anatomical classification of the acute aortic syndrome, assess the extent of the involvement and the complications. And CT and MRI are the um, main imaging modality, but TE in some cases may have a role, particularly in unstable patients. Uh, aortic dissections have a high risk of mortality, and uh, that's why type A dissection uh, uh, need to be immediately evaluated for surgery because that's the best uh, way to reduce mortality. But the uh, medical therapy should be given to all patients, uh, low, lower the blood pressure and the heart rate, use of beta blockers, and if needed, additional blood pressure lowering agents, and a pain control. Surgical evaluation is necessary, and that's why you need to have a multidisciplinary team, imaging, vascular medicine, uh, vascular surgery, cardiac surgery. And in patients who are stable, transfer to a high volume aortic center is reasonable. And uh, surgery also in patients with stroke uh, should be considered. For abdominal aortic disease, uh, the definition is an aneurysm of three centimeter, centimeters of higher. Uh, we, the prevalence is relatively uh, low and smoking and age uh, and male sex are the main risk factors. And family history of hypertension and cholesterolemia are additional risk factors, but not as strong. The primary concerns for patients with the AAA is that the risk of rupture and death from hemorrhage and diameter is the main a driver of the risk of uh, complications. So that's why screening for a aortic aneurysm has been implemented and in men has been shown to be effective. And ultrasound is usually the uh, screening modality. So occasionally patient may have an indecidental finding when they are uh, screen uh, when they are undergoing imaging such as CT abdomen for other reasons. And the screening is in patients who have a history of smoking and are 65 and old. In screening work, and there are criteria, I'm not going in detail, that uh, uh, we can follow to uh, determine the risk uh, of rupture and when uh, we should use alternative imaging. This is, a, in my opinion, a very important uh, slide from the most recent guidelines because it differentiates the risk between men and women. Women have a higher risk. And when their aortic uh, aneurysm is growing, they need to have more frequent surveillance imaging and they have to have a lower threshold uh, for repair. And again, management of blood pressure, smoking sensation, statin use, and antithrombotic therapy is a constant theme. And the size of repair is 5.5, I'm sorry, centimeters in or higher in men and five centimeters or higher in women. And endovascular repair is a, a, a sort of a plus one indication and 
uh, now is considered the first uh, uh, approach for repair. Splanchnic arterial disease. This is a relatively smaller uh, topic, but uh, patients who have splanchnic disease have an involvement of the various branches of the abdominal aorta. Atherosclerotic disease is a prevalent etiology, but there are non atherosclerotic causes. Again, celiac uh, compression syndrome, in this case, is called celiac artery compression by the median arcuate ligament, MALT. Embolic events, vasculitis, fibromuscular dysplasia, segmental arterial mediolysis, vascular LR download, all are risk factors. And the clinical presentation depends on the underlying pathology and ranges from acute abdominal pain with or without bowel ischemia, the, is, for instance, an acute dissection of the celiac artery and superior mesenteric artery, or to chronic abdominal angina with weight loss. Usually this is atherosclerotic and takes time so the patients have this discomfort. They really have phobia for food because they get this discomfort. And the treatment uh, depends on whether it's acute or chronic. Acute treatment may be conservative with close monitoring, patients with small dissections uh, that require surveillance imaging, with use of antithrombotic or uh, anticoagulation. Uh, sometimes they need acute revascularization. And in patients with angina, abdominal angina, stable angina, elective revascularization would be the uh, way to go. Now a quick look at extremity, lower extremity peripheral artery disease. We can divide into three segments, the inflow, which is the aortoiliac, the outflow, the femoral popliteal, and the runoff of the infrapopliteal. This is important because that's the terminology that the radiologists and the vascular surgeons are uh, using for description of this uh, disease. PED, uh, as defined by the guidelines, is peripheral artery disease is a manifestation of atherosclerotic disease, but the risk factors are not exactly overlapping with the standard atherosclerotic risk factors because age um, and diabetes and smoking are the three strongest risk factors. But hypertension is not much and uh, other uh, 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 hypercholesterolemia, again, not as strong. The Typical manifestation is intermittent claudication. That means to limp. Patients may have pain, cramping of the calf, thigh, or buttocks that occur when the walking is relieved by rest. And I had this patient recently. She was complaining of not calf, but right-sided lateral um, uh, discomfort, sort of a burning sensation. And I ordered imaging, and she did have first of all, reduced ABI, and then the presence of uh, significant stenosis. We have to keep in mind that some patients say, I don't have these symptoms. Why is that? Not sometimes because they are not walking, they are not exercising. But we have to keep in mind that whether symptomatic or symptomatic, patients with PAD have worse outcomes in both with regards to their functional status and with regards to cardiovascular events, including MI, stroke, and death. And patients with severe PD, peripheral artery disease, have both risk of uh, limb events, chronic uh, critical limb ischemia, amputation, and um, uh, loss of tissue, uh, uh, in addition to cardiovascular events. So by no means, the lack of symptoms in patients with PAD should be considered a mild uh, presentation. So the guidelines recommend to use uh, the uh, ankle brachial indices for the diagnosis. In addition, we can use segmental pressure and pulse volume recordings. This is the standard tracings that the, uh, you know most vascular lab produce in which you have all of these. And how do we treat patients? Well, we treat patients for their claudication, for their symptoms, and for their cardiovascular risk. The only treatment that for symptoms that has received pharmacologic treatment uh, uh, approval by the guidelines is lost as all, uh, whereas pentoxifiline has not been considered effective and other therapies such as chelation therapy are not effective. But we should use antiplatelet therapy, aspirin, 
And we should use obviously statins and we should use antihypertensive agents whenever needed. Now, the, the last uh, rush, venous disease. Well, uh, venous thromboembolism is obviously the most common manifestation of venous disease and is due to an activa uh, inappropriate activation of the um, uh, uh, thrombotic uh, system and of the clotting system. And the two main manifestations often coexisting are deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. We have to keep in mind that acute venous thromboembolism is the third cause of cardiovascular mortality and the leading cause of short and long-term morbidity. Most of these cases occur within a hospitalization and it is a major avoidable uh, um, uh, illness and uh, complication of hospitalization, particularly of uh, surgical hospitalization. Normally, thrombi tend to form in deep veins in the calf and then propagate into popliteal and proximal vein. And proximal lower extremity DVT is uh, associated with the presence of pulmonary embolism in approximately 50% of patients. 70 to 80% of PEs begin in thrombi in the deep vein, uh, but all of the lower extremities or the pelvis. And only 6% originate in the upper extremities. That's why upper extremity DVT is sort of relatively less concerning. Manifestation of deep venous thrombosis, edema, that can be as uh, prom prominent uh, to cause a, what we call phlegmasia cerebral dolence, the a compartment syndrome of the entire leg with cessation of arterial flow. Obviously, that causes pain, tenderness, discoloration, cramping, heaviness prominence of the veins. But we have to keep in mind that sometimes very large thrombi may be completely asymptomatic, have minimal edema, and present only as a pulmonary embolism. This is the diagnostic modality of choice, which is compression ultrasound. We can see on the right that the, the vein, this is the common femoral vein, completely obliterates when the technology compresses, whereas on the left, there is no obliteration. We say that there is uh, non-compressibility, -comp and we can see that there is the presence of mostly hypoechoic or anechoic thrombus. So without compression, this may be missed. And that's why we need to do compression ultrasonography. The presentation of pulmonary embolism, we are mostly familiar, dyspnea, chest pain, pleuritic chest pain, hemoptysis, tachypnea, tachycardia, and the other manifestation of right ventricular failure. But it can be asymptomatic, or patients may present with even a col syncope collapse. And because the symptoms may be nonspecific, diagnosis may be missed, and we should be to should have a high level of suspicion in patients who may be at risk. And that's why we have appropriate scores like, such as the well score. And uh, we should uh, uh, consider uh, doing an evaluation also in patients who don't have a shortness of breath. Only 5 to 10% of patients who have pulmonary embolism report shortness of breath. Pulmonary CT and geography is the imaging of choice for PE. The VQ scan is rarely used because uh, it has a much lower um, accuracy, and, but it's mostly used in patients with contraindication to contrast medium. And invasive pulmonary angiography is used mostly when there is a procedure. Now, IVC filters, we are often called in, uh, by as vascular specialists to determine indications for IVC filter. The clear indication is only when a patient has an acute pulmonary embolism with contraindication to anticoagulation or when they have a recurrence of the pulmonary embolism despite therapeutic anticoagulation. You can consider insertion in, on an individual basis for patients with pulmonary embolism who are receiving anticoagulation but still have a large burden of thrombus in the lower extremities or in the inferior vena cava, and that have limited cardiopulmonary reserve, in which you are concerned that even a very small additional thrombus could uh, precipitate the compensation. Okay, uh, now 
a, a quick summary. So vascular medicine is a medical subspecialty that focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of diseases, uh, sorry, of disease of the arterial, venous, and lymphatic system. Traditionally, the care of patients with vascular diseases has often been fragmented among various specialties without a clear primary provider, leading to delays in diagnosis and treatment. The vascular medicine specialist has broad knowledge of the anatomy and physiology of the cardiocirculatory system, deep understanding of the mechanisms of vascular diseases, familiarity with the diagnostic testing, and knowledge of the available treatments for vascular diseases. And so uh, uh, the specialist can provide the necessary coordination for the care of patients with vascular diseases. Thank you so much for your attention and my apologies for whirlwind of things. Thank you. I guess. Thank you very much, uh, Umberto. That was basically um, uh, a marathon of uh, almost covering the entire field. Well, I'm going to open it up for discussion. I think this is a very uh, important space where uh, obviously in healthcare system, we need to do better. Um, uh, Som, you have any immediate reactions of uh, what should be the future like and what are questions for Umberto? Yeah, well, Dr. Campia, I uh, really appreciated your talk. I thought it was fantastic. Um, and I appreciate someone such as yourself who has a passion for this area of vascular medicine. So thank you for that. Uh, I have a few questions where we could just get it, get it started off. Um, sure. <clears throat> the first question is about uh, early in your presentation about temporal arteritis. And years ago, we used to get called quite urgently to perform biopsies on these patients. Um, because the treating physician wanted to know whether they wanted to start the patient on steroids. We don't get called that often anymore, but we still get called. And the question I have for you <clears throat> is regarding ultrasound imaging and this so-called halo sign, that if a physician is um, entertaining this in their differential diagnosis, if the patient has a duplex ultrasound of the temporal arteries that is does not have a halo sign, um, you know, should we still be thinking about performing biopsy? And if there's still a su suspicion to do biopsy, to increase the yield, should we always be biopsying both sides? Yeah, excellent question. So first of all, we have uh, a dedicated group, it's three of us, there are, uh, we went for specific training. Uh, there is this uh, group in Europe where they have a very active uh, uh, imaging uh, approach to um, multimodality imaging approach to arthritis. They're rheumatologists in the part of the ULAR. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the ultrasound is considered, you know, a, now a point of care. And so it is often we have a, a urgent way for us to uh, do a vascular ultrasound of the temporal artery to determine if there is. If there is a diagnosis then uh, by ultrasound, then the rheumatologist does not usually need to uh, order a biopsy and start treatment because many times is the, is the timing that is really short. You don't want to waste three days for a patient that may get a blindness from a, a, a from an, an occlusion of the ophthalmic artery from the uh, giant cell arthritis. So. Uh, the ultrasound is a point of care now, and if there is concern, then uh, treatment is warranted. If the ultrasound is negative, that's the next step. We have still multimodality imaging, and PET scan and MRI have become extremely useful because they can visualize arteries that even with the vascular ultrasound, we don't visualize, let's say the uh, occipital artery, you can visualize the uh, uh, facial artery that may be uh, sort of uh, inflamed. So the biopsy now is when you have a 
imaging modality that has not given a definitive evidence and the patient still is considered to have a high suspicion. But as you know well, the uh, biopsy oftentimes because the arthritis can be patchy, you may not have the biopsy in the segment. Sometimes also it's difficult to determine if the um, uh, segment that uh, you have uh, collected uh, is within the area where you should be because the patient may have generic pain. So um, biopsy is still has still a role, but less than in the past. Thank you. And have you any of your rheumatology colleagues or you... Um had the vascular surgeons asking how much temporal artery had some rheumatologists say that they want quite a sizable amount, which would require yeah. a much larger incision and, yeah, and yeah. comment on that. Yeah. The, that's the thing that our, uh, the request is as long as possible. I would say a couple of centimeters, uh, at the least, uh, but again, it's patchy. And again, sometimes you have giant cell arteritis, but not in the superficial temporal, not in the uh, common, not in the parietal, not in the, in the uh, expected sites, and you have a facial or occipital. Thank you. Dr. Avasti, uh, any questions for... Uh, well, uh, Dr. Campia, there was a really, like uh, Parthas said, whirlwind tour down the vascular system uh, it was very well done, engaging talk, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, my questions to you um, are related to sort of the garden variety peripheral arterial disease. In your practice, uh, so in my practice, typically for claudicans, unless it's really bad lifestyle limitation uh, and they've sort of given up smoking, uh, my, my initial uh, recommendation is always exercise therapy. So, so the one question is, uh, is how often do you and, and how successful are you with that in, in, in the, the Brigham? And the second is in patients who are revascularized, especially in the, uh, um, the not the outflow vessel, but the below the knee vessels, um, you know, spe specifically diabetics who are at high risk, and usually we do this for critical limb ischemia, uh, those as well as other critical limb ischemia patients, how often are you using DOAX based on the compass, you know, with the low dose Zeralto when you take off the Plavix, for example? Yeah, uh, excellent. So uh, first question with regards to exercise. I discuss this with every patient. Uh, most of the times patients have major issues with regard to the ability to have the 12 weeks uh, of three times a week to go to uh, a rehab. There aren't many rehab uh, centers, at least in, in our area here in Boston, that do uh, PAD because the reimbursement, yes, the CMS is reimbursing, but it's pretty low. So uh, I try my success, I would say is modest at best. Uh, with regards to um, uh, sort of um, revascularization, obviously, I uh, tend to uh, um, uh, refer patients that may have really uh, severely uh, limiting uh, sort of claudication. Uh, for patients that have relatively modest claudication, I tend to encourage activity, obviously, smoking cessation. I start psilocybin for those who tolerate, and then when they really have mm, sort of uh, done their best and they're still symptomatic, then I refer for revascularization. Uh, the compass, uh, I uh, try to use it, and I especially in patients with polyvascular disease, because th those are the ones that encompass really benefited the most. At the same time, uh, as you mentioned, some may need to uh, be on at least temporarily on uh, clopidogrel, which was not part of the trial. So uh, whenever they can be the transition from uh, um, clopidogrel to aspirin, I try to start. I also try to start as much as possible uh, uh, if covered by insurance, uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, you know, the Fourier trial. 
Evolocuma, the reduced cardiovascular events and the reduced limb events. So those are the most effective therapies that in the last five years we have had for patients with um, peripheral artery disease. But uh, reimbursement and not just reimbursement is the number of medications that patients have to take that is limiting that. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Just one other, um, you know, since this was uh, peripheral arterial disease, moving to the vein vein side of uh, therapies, um, I'm sure you guys have a good PERT program in in at the Brigham for uh, for uh, your D DVTPE program. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the PERT program, how how much is how often do you refer people? Uh, for are you using very strict guidelines? Is it some, you know because it's a very center dependent thing. Some centers are tending to take a lot more people initially, and some centers tend to wait with the appropriate antithrombotic therapy. So, what is your experience at the Brigham with that? So, uh, yeah, I, I guess you are referring specifically to uh, thrombectomy uh, or uh, you know um, facilitated thrombolysis. Correct. So, uh, we tend to have a relatively low threshold to take patients to the cath lab uh, if they have intermediate high-risk uh, pulmonary embolism. We follow the European guidelines because obviously they're much more recent and more relevant. And we uh, have obviously different devices, flow triber, we have the ECOS. And so we do uh, follow a little bit more of the patient and the, the overall uh, sort of uh, trajectory. If the patient is very stable on um, on standard anticoagulation and has no um, significant desaturation, tachycardia, we monitor. If we see that the clinical course starts to uh, deteriorate, that's when we tend to intervene. Thanks. Yeah, sure. There is a question in the um, uh, comment sections here. Um, so it's from Dr. Maganti. Uh, she compliments you for an excellent talk. Uh, why we are not indexing abdominal aorta size to body surface area? So that, that's a great question. So um, I think that the abdominal aorta, we have uh, more data with regards to the risk of rupture than the, uh, um, than the thoracic aorta. And also uh, the uh, thoracic aorta tends to be uh, probably more dependent on the um, body size or uh, the uh, cross-sectional area, and that's why we don't use that in for the abdominal aorta. But to be honest, I haven't really uh, ever focused on that. It's my sort of uh, gestalt. Great. And I have a quick, a quick question. So, Umberto, if you were to organize a multidisciplinary uh, vascular, uh, you know, where you center, uh, where you you could talk about aortic or peripheral vascular. What, how do you do uh, this uh, in a way? Uh, is it centralized, decentralized? How do, how do you work this out? Because obviously people are, have different units have to come together. So do you guys meet together or how do you do this? So uh, the I think that the, there may be two uh, sort of log the logistical part and then sort of the more, uh, um, I would say, communication part. The logistical part can help in the sense that if you are uh, sharing the clinical space, so if you have uh, in, the, in the sort of workroom, you have the vascular specialist, the, the medical uh, vascular medicine, you have the vascular surgery, you have the um, um, uh, sort of uh, cardiac surgery, you can, like at the Brigham now we, we have that. It obviously is more easy to, in, to inter sort of interact and to work together. At the same time, 
you know, when I do my cardio oncology and vascular oncology, I deal with, uh, you know, uh, uh, providers who are oncologists. They are not definitely in the clinic. They are at Dana Faber, which is another institution completely. So the communication can be established and you can manage in a multidisciplinary uh, fashion, even patients, uh, the, I mean, even when you are not physically in the same space. So I think that the uh, uh, commitment of the different uh, uh, providers and the different specialties to the program is more important than the necessarily the sharing the physical space. Great point. I think that makes uh, uh, perfect sense because I think uh, the commitment uh, to come together um, in patient care is uh, probably the most important central piece. And um, thank you very much. I know it's pretty late, uh, but uh, thank you, Sorry. Dr. Kimi, Dr. Awasti, and Dr. Campia for a great session. I think it should stimulate us to think differently, and I think it will stimulate our fellows to think that it's not just interventional and EP, and you know, there is also a large piece in vascular medicine that is untapped. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, so I think we should look forward to also training and thinking about how do we stimulate more work and, and training in this direction is equally important because there's a large burden of vas peripheral vascular disease that probably we do not attend to well. Um, yeah. so this, Doctor, uh, this if you want to intervene one quick second, there's another question in the chat from Dr. Pantin, if you wanted to take it. Oh, hi, uh, Dr. Enric Pantin. Is it a nutritionist involved uh, and nutritional, nutri nutritional follow-up for these patients? Are they part of the primary team members? Uh, we don't have a, a, a nutritionist uh, as part of the, the group. We have our usually, uh, I refer patients to our bariatric clinic if there is any uh, need for a, a help and management of the nutritional aspect. But I think the preventive arm of um, cardiology is so underestimated the importance of, like when you mentioned about tobacco cessation and oh, yeah. and all that, that's a completely different um, large aspect that we typically don't attend to. I think, so Dr. Pantin also uh, uh, invo invokes a very important question. And, and, thank you, uh, and thank you, Dr. Pantin for joining. He's a uh, cardiac anesthesiologist, is the division chief. So I think oh, you can fantastic. imagine the amount of uh, excitement you have, uh, uh, you know, these series are invoking, I think, because we are really thinking about how do we create multidisciplinary uh, environment for shared decision making. So thank yeah. you everyone for staying late and I look, look forward to seeing you next week when you come over here. Looking forward as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Good, so much. Good night. Bye. Thank you.